Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Core. I'm the executive director of the Tennessee Historical Society, and this is number 10 in our series, Tennessee 101, Tennessee Women in the Progressive Era. So before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question, if you could put that in the Q&A box that you'll see on your toolbar, um, we may answer it during the presentation or we may hold it until after the presentations are done. Um, don't use the chat box. Um, Nikki, our program manager, is going to be using that to put any useful links that we might have for you into there. And now I don't want to go forward. Forward, come on. Okay, so you won't want to miss next week, so you'll want to go to our programs page in order to register for that. We're going to be talking about women in the public sphere. And I wanted to point out that on each one of our individual pages, down in the bottom right corner, we have resources. One link will take you to the first volume that Dr. Mary Evans has edited. And the second one will take you to what we're calling the Padlet, which is a fancy word for online cloud storage. And this is what it looks like. And here's where you'll go to find slides that the presenters have provided and links, maybe some uh, useful additional sources. And that will remain up um, for quite a while. We're not gonna take that down anytime soon. If you missed one of these sessions, if you go to that particular page, you'll find down at the bottom the recording of it. And we don't actually include the questions at the end in the recordings because sometimes people have personal questions or they mention a family name or something about themselves that might be revealing. So we end the recordings with the second presenter's talk. Um, a good way to keep up with what we're doing is to follow us on social media. This is where we're going to be announcing our next series, which we're not going to start for a while. We still have one left of this, but we are planning on continuing Tennessee 101. If you follow us on social media, you'll be the first to find out about it. And we do want to thank Humanities Tennessee who funded this. Without them, we could not continue to bring these presentations to you. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Manoa Uffelman. Dr. Uffelman is professor of history at Austin P. State University in Clarksville, and she's going to introduce our two speakers. Manoa, all yours. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, uh, Tennessee Historical Society and Humanities Tennessee. Tennessee was instrumental in the passage of the 19th Amendment. Tonight, our speakers will examine two very different aspects of suffrage, one, what did hometown newspapers say about suffrage? How was the issue covered? And secondly, what did the suffragists themselves write as they recorded their own history? Our first speaker is Dr. Melanie Schimberger, Associate Professor of Journalism and Mass Communications at Murray State University. Her presentation is titled Suffrage in Tennessee, Hometown Newspapers. Our second presenter is Dr. Miranda Fraley Rhodes. She is the chief curator at the Tennessee State Museum in Nashville. She was the lead curator for the women's suffrage exhibit, ratified Tennessee women and the right to vote. Her paper, her presentation is titled Suffragists Writing Their History. So I will turn the um, computer over to Melanie. Melanie will give her uh, presentation and when she finishes she'll turn it over to Miranda. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you Dr. Uffelman and welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen and get the presentation started. And there we go. Um, I'm really fortunate to have been a part of this project. Um, Dr. Uffelman is one of my role models, and she knows that because I publicly have said that before. So when she emailed me about, I think, three or four years ago to participate, asking if I wanted to participate, I couldn't say no. And plus, it, it really tugs at the heartstring of one of my favorite research topics, and that is focusing on um, newspapers, journalism history, and media history. And there's a lot to be said about this part of journalism history as it relates to suffrage in Tennessee's 
hometown newspapers. We're going to look at really those hometown newspapers. Local newspapers in the United States were rooted as a community's norm. Since the rise of the penny press era, and if you don't know what penny press was, that was when a single issue was sold for one cent in the 1830s and then a surge of local news over the decades, the local newspaper has served as a forum for local issues, events, and personalities shaping and supporting Supporting the local public sphere. The late 19th and early 20th centuries were marked with intense competition among newspapers for circulation, um, so much so that local coverage was emphasized over foreign news because it was popular with readers. While the purpose of modern newspapers has transcended beyond politics in the 21st century, the local newspaper in the early 20th century created an environment for readers to experience and understand the events around them by producing content that was relevant to them. Local newspapers in Tennessee followed the trend of highlighting local content on their pages. News about suffrage appeared in these publications, but a variety of newspapers approached the subject of suffrage differently. In this presentation, local or hometown newspapers, and we're looking at those in small communities throughout Tennessee and really situated outside the metropolitan areas of Nashville, Knoxville, Memphis, and Chattanooga, are, are discussed. The smaller newspapers tend to be overlooked in historical and academic literature in favor of larger metro paper coverage when the topic of suffrage in Tennessee is examined and really almost in any topic that is examined. And that's why I really wanted to bring to light more of the, uh, the analysis of hometown newspapers in this. Although the hometown newspapers publish news about suffrage, the stories largely came from other newspapers, some metro, and they appeared buried on the inside pages. Little to no editorial bias was evident in local newspapers, meaning that hometown papers that were studied in this presentation uh, did not exhibit a profound or obvious pro-suffrage or anti-suffrage perspective that could be seen in the Metro papers. And later I will explain how I arrived at that conclusion. However, this does not mean that the local newspapers are less significant or unworthy to study in the context of suffrage. On the contrary, these publications should be examined since newspapers of all kinds help to educate the public on Tennessee's rise to become the perfect 36th state in the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Daily newspapers such as the Tennessean tracked the early 20th century development of suffrage, but an examination of weekly newspaper coverage is needed to observe the movement completely and to build a more robust historiography of media and suffrage. The presidential, I'm going to back up just a little bit, the presidential and the municipal suffrage bill that was passed in the legislature during the 1919 session was a substantial victory for woman suffrage in Tennessee and a prelude to the pinnacle when Tennessee became that needed 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment in 1920. Therefore, the months between 1919, especially in spring of 1919 and summer 1920, would lead to an increase in suffrage news being published in Tennessee newspapers. Publicity in Tennessee newspapers was an important factor in the education of public opinion regarding woman suffrage. Newspapers in the early 20th century were considered a top mass medium for citizens to educate themselves on the issues of the day. News and information pertaining to the women's suffrage movement frequently appeared in newspaper articles, editorials, letters, uh, the letters from citizens and other content. More than 30 suffrage newspapers were published throughout the nation during the seven decades of the women's suffrage movement because the mainstream press often ridiculed suffragists. Now, none were published in Tennessee. Suffrage was certainly covered in the major daily papers in Tennessee cities. Uh, and I've already talked about those four major ones. And in the smaller cities and towns across the state, a county's local newspaper, which often just a weekly publication filled with local news interest, would have been the mouthpiece for settling issues involving women's rights. So given this, and if this is so, um, so put, this is kind of my question that really helped me to cement uh, this project a little bit. How did local newspapers treat the subject of woman suffrage on their pages? 
Um, were suffrage stories prominent on the front page or definitely were they buried inside the, the newspaper? And there were some other questions that went along, but this was the main driving question that I really wanted to explore. In the early years of the 20th century, the number of newspapers registered at a record high. According to the U.S. Census of 1910, there were more than 2,200 English language daily newspapers in general circulation and about 14,000 weekly newspapers across the United States. Newspapers in the early 20th century were published by printers or operated as separate businesses. Now let's break down that number a little bit. In Tennessee, you had about 413 printing and publishing establishments that existed. And to break that number down even uh, further, there were 330 newspapers and other periodicals such as magazines in Tennessee with 45 printing and publishing businesses in Memphis and then 86 in Nashville. Now, both of these cities had uh, 50,000 or more residents. This means that the 282 other printing and publishing businesses were located in towns and cities with a population of less than 50,000 people in 1910. Weekly newspapers outnumbered the dailies in Tennessee in 1910 with 223 in business. However, the number of weeklies would drop over the next decade, about 182 uh, in 1920. And then by 1920 in total, you had 330 newspapers that were in operation. In many instances, some newspapers operated as family businesses and often the owners of small weekly papers were the papers only staff members. For newspapers in small towns and rural areas, the wire services proved essential in filling local pages with state, national, and world news. With 51% of the population of the United States still classified as rural before World, world War I, small newspapers played vital roles in their respective communities, often, often serving as political voices. Specifically, coverage of the campaign for women's right to vote, ending with the addition of the 19th Amendment, uh, set the agenda for enhanced visibility of women's issues. Large newspapers established women's pages where content about suffrage and other items of interest for women could be found. In the early 1900s, women's sections covered the changing progress of women in jobs and professions and their demands for voting and other legal reforms. Women's pages have long been criticized for offering frivolous content, such as recipes, fashion, and advice columns, but they have been a platform where women's voices were heard on several issues, including the suffragist movement. In many, uh, new, uh, excuse me, many Metro newspapers, stories about women's suffrage first appeared on the women's pages rather than the front pages of American newspapers. In Tennessee, Metro papers, such as the Tennessean, published suffrage news on their women's pages. They were also called society pages. However, for the small hometown newspapers, suffrage news was placed in spaces that would just fit. Um, there was really sometimes no rhyme or reason. Just if it fit there, that's where it went. And then sometimes, and many times actually, they were buried on the inside pages. So one of the things I wanna help do, that was some contextual information, but I think it's also important as we're studying newspapers, we, we have to find some sort of lens to do so. And this is probably where I think more of my social science approach comes into play with this. But one of the theories that I've, I've, I've always enjoyed studying and helped me to frame this study so that way it really shaped well uh, was the agenda setting theory. It was initially proposed in 1972 by journalism professors, Maxwell McCombs, and his colleague, Donald Shaw. And Donald Shaw was actually one of my favorite theorists to study. And unfortunately he died last year, um, but he really was instrumental in taking this theory and developing it even more. So you're probably thinking, wow, um, we've got a, a 1970s theory, a late 20th century approach to studying an early 20th century topic. Well, well, we'll go through all of that. So this theory is a basic theoretical framework that originally applied to media coverage of political candidates, but it is often used to understand the viability of any sort of communication topic. It postulates on the one hand that people devote more thought to issues and objects that are more salient in the media coverage, while conversely acknowledging that media coverage can affect how citizens think about issues. The ways topics are covered by the media, in other words, can directly influence and even create how consumers think about covered topics. 
although developed decades after the ratification of the 19th, um, as an analytical method for evaluating the comparative importance of current events and subject matter written about in the news, agenda setting can assist in examining how Tennessee hometown newspapers presented the news of woman suffrage on the pages of their papers. It can be effective in recognizing and highlighting certain aspects, such as uh, biases perceived through the placement of articles of newspaper coverage regarding the woman suffrage movement in Tennessee. Agenda setting can be used to study and interpret how local newspapers shaped their community's perception and understanding of the vote for women and the roles played by women in civic life. The level of importance attributed to a public news item by a newspaper's owner or publisher or editor can be ascertained, according to this theory. Um, by a news item's position on the news page and also by its depth of burial within the paper. Newsworthy topics of community value generally are selected as front page items with bold headlines. Less significant, less weighty fillers are not and usually are embedded later in the paper. The value communicated to and shaping a paper's readership may demonstrate the values of the newspaper establishment or ownership itself or it may be an effort to properly represent the attitudes and interests of the paper's hometown audience. Either way, studying suffrage through the lens of agenda setting is an assessment tool to measure the comparative importance and concept placement of the issue of woman suffrage across Tennessee communities. Therefore, to see how local or hometown newspapers throughout Tennessee set the agenda of suffrage on their pages for their readers, this project relied on the Chronicling America Historic American Newspapers database. I know that's a mouthful. So I used that and I like that database because it, it looks for those newspapers that tend to be kind of hard to find um, to some extent. But I used that and searched for the keyword suffrage in Tennessee newspapers between January 1 of 1919 and December 31st of 1920. There's a reason why, and I'll get to that. While large newspapers such as the Tennessean covered the topic frequently, this project included 54 news items, such as articles and editorials published from May 2nd of 1919 through September 23rd of 1920 in the small local newspapers. So the historic vote on the U.S. Constitutional Amendment was accomplished in a special session of the Tennessee General Assembly on August 18th, 1920. Therefore, the entirety of 1920 was searched for suffrage discussion articles, those staging the political environment leading up to the vote, as well as those in the weeks following the vote. The Chronicling America newspaper search generated more than 2,700 newspaper pages in which the word suffrage, uh, typically an article about suffrage, was published in Tennessee papers. That's a lot. So, of course, I could not go through all of those in time. But these pages not only include articles in the rural county newspapers, but also identified suffrage news items in the urban newspapers from the four major cities there in Tennessee. Um, so therefore the, the number of results was markedly reduced because the big city papers, I extracted those from the count being used in the study. So only small town papers being used. Early 20th century Tennessee papers, such as um, some of these, I'm not gonna read them all. And in fact, the chapter does list uh, my paper that's included in, in the chap in the book does list all the newspapers that were a part of this project, but you do see some of them listed right there. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that we had a representation of newspapers across Tennessee. So that way we didn't have so many from the western part of the state or in middle Tennessee or in the eastern part. So there's a good spread of um, 16 newspapers that were represented in this project, a total of 54 uh, different articles, uh, edit editorials as well, articles, anything news content um, from those papers. A few editions published news items relating to suffrage on more than one page. And then the placement of each news story or editorial on the page also was recorded. I kept a, a spreadsheet that kind of tracked all of these, these things and helped me to make some observations that we'll talk about. 
So two months after Tennessee granted uh, women partial suffrage in 1919, Congress passed, of course, the 19th Amendment um, a year later. And then by the spring of 1920, 35 states had ratified it. If one more state had, had approved it, women could have been uh, enfranchised in time to cast their ballots in the fall presidential election. Of course, we know that Delaware was really the state that was eyed upon, and it, we Everybody really thought that that would be the state to be the, um, the necessary state to ratify. And unexpectedly, it defeated the suffrage amendment in early June. That I, I like to use sports analogies, so I think that caused the suffrages to back up and punt. Um, so they had to figure out a new game plan. And so all eyes then became on Tennessee um, and then counting on Tennessee to become that 36th state. So newspaper coverage outside of Tennessee focused on this development. Given this progression of events overall in Tennessee, news about suffrage intensified in the hometown press between the time when partial suffrage was granted in 1919 and the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And that was why I wanted to really make sure that 1919 and 1920, that we had a good spread of that time frame. So several observations from the newspapers in this project are really worthy to note. And these are just a few. So my chapter explains a lot more, but just for um, uh, because of brevity, I needed to keep this concise. But some, these are the primary ones. Uh, first, hometown papers used more wire stories and news-related content about suffrage prepared by others, such as publicity from national press superintendents or agents of suffrage organizations. Um, and here's an example right here. The Morgan County Press, that's the front page of that newspaper. And then and as you see on the right side, this page is an inside page from the Camden Chronicle, both published in August of 1920 in the days leading up to the historic vote. Um, and what I want to bring your attention to, if you notice here uh, up in the Morgan County Press, upper left hand corner, why American women want the ballot. And it goes on. This is a complete suffrage story. This is also right here a separate, a separate suffrage story, suffrage in the Southern states. And then right here to the lower right of that page of vital importance to women. These three stories were part of a package that the National American Woman Suffrage Association put together. They would prepare what was known as press work, um, or excuse me, um, plate work rather. Um, plate work is, we, we often say boilerplate. It's just like a template. Well, they just provided this type of material, almost camera ready, if you will, that was already preset. So that way publishers and editors could just use it and put it on the page. So that's the Morgan County Press. The exact same content appeared on the inside page of the Camden Chronicle. Um, so you can see that story here and then suffrage in the Southern states and then of vital importance to women. Um, so this was really common in the hometown newspapers uh, that I noticed, especially in these um, Tennessee papers. And really these articles demonstrated the importance of the amendment. Uh, one national law, not state by state variations. So that was really something that the, um, uh, I call it NASA just, just for short, but really that the National American Woman Suffrage Association wanted to convey in the days in the final push for ratification. And then second, placement of suffrage news throughout the newspaper pages in Tennessee hometown newspapers was mixed in those days between the front and inside pages. Additionally, the location on the page top, middle, or bottom also varied widely. None of the small papers that were part of this project had really explicit women's pages. And the random placements of the suffrage articles could suggest that news copy about suffrage was based either on the order in which an editor might have received the content for inclusion, or whether an article just geometrically fit a certain amount of space on a page. Pointed intentionality is not readily visible in the placement patterns in these papers, nor is purposeful minimization of the story. Rather, random insertion appears to be more how the article placement took place. And for us in journalism history, this raises a scholarly enlightenment of the applicability of the agenda setting theory. Local hometown papers included suffrage news because they were current events, but the placement of the stories resulted in the articles being mostly buried on the inside pages. This kind of editorial decision could indicate the value that small newspapers placed on suffrage, but it could also reflect a routine of filling pages just in time with articles 
just to print an issue. Regardless, a degree of agenda setting can be observed. And then third, um, none of the stories in this review um, had a writer's byline. Uh, so if you have a headline for a new story, then right underneath, you're going to have who wrote the story. That's what we call a byline. Um, and I think that's pretty important to, to note. Um, because many hometown newspapers of the era operated under a few family members or small partnership, bylines may not have been used. Additionally, because the role of women in journalism in the early 20th century in the South was quite limited, most of those in the local newspapers writing articles about women at the time were not women. The articles, as discussed in this project, were written by the National Association, or excuse me, National American Woman Suffrage Association press superintendents, which happens to be my next um, research project that actually I'm working on right now. Other stories printed in the hometown newspapers were picked up from newspapers in surrounding towns and counties, and then they were reprinted. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, basically conclude with a few final thoughts. Um, publicity in newspapers throughout Tennessee was an important factor in the education of public opinion. However, unlike the society pages of the large city newspapers, hometown publications in Tennessee approached the subject of suffrage with little to no editorial bias in content selection and placement. The articles were placed in a random fashion to fill gaps in the page. In addition, the articles were republished from other newspapers and sources, such as the, um, the Suffrage Association, and where they appear depended on space and other topics and subjects being reported in the communities. Um, none of the papers as part of this project exhibited a profound or obvious pro-suffrage or an anti-suffrage perspective. Although the Tennessee hometown papers published various news items about suffrage, much of the coverage about partial coverage, or excuse me, partial suffrage was buried on the inside pages. It was not until Tennessee became the focal stage for the 19th Amendment that the local publications featured the itch issue prominently on their front pages. In other words, these small community newspapers set the agenda. Uh, through an article's position on a page when the topic of suffrage became a national issue. Tennessee was under the national microscope by lawmakers and newspapers as the state that would decide whether the 19th Amendment would become a reality for women. Sensing the growth of suffrage as news in the months and weeks leading up to the vote in the Tennessee General Assembly in 1920, newspaper publishers throughout the nation and the state responded by placing articles higher on their publication's agenda. For some papers, that meant front page coverage. For others, it would be closer to the top of an inside page or an entire inside page was devoted to suffrage. And that was noted in a, in a few um, situations. Throughout the campaign for the 19th Amendment, hometown papers in Tennessee maintained a relatively unbiased voice in their news content on the vote for women. It did not matter whether the reader was pro-suffrage or anti-suffrage, these newspapers provided subscribers important, relevant information and reported the facts. Arguably, the location of a particular article on a newspaper's page could indicate a degree of bias, but the majority of articles about woman suffrage in Tennessee provided basic yet highly newsworthy information to local readers. Going back just a little bit to tie in the theory, agenda setting, news organizations do not tell readers what to think, despite the political views of editors and publishers for or against an issue. Rather, news outlets suggest, or at least that's what they should be doing, rather news outlets should suggest what readers should think about. Agenda setting, therefore, helps to explain the local newspaper treatment of suffrage. Agenda setting, or as the uh, suffrage vote drew nearer, Tennessee hometown newspapers endeavored to educate their communities on the topics to consider, or simply to think about, not always how or which opinion or view to adopt. Where the article appeared in the issue might not, not, might not have been a major consideration for many publishers of small newspapers, but only that the story appeared somewhere to keep the readers informed about suffrage. And that concludes my presentation.
Well, um, I just want to start by thanking everyone who's joining us uh, today and um, also the Tennessee Historical Society for the invitation to speak with you. So this evening, I'll be talking about suffragists writing their histories. And um, this is going to be a very a contested process. And we'll find Tennessee suffragists both making history and writing history pretty much simultaneously and choosing what to remember and what to forget. Um, so I'm going to specifically look at um, work that was done for the History of Women's Suffrage, which is a multi-volume publication of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And as scholar Lisa Tarrault points out, um, these volumes of suffrage history were really important to the beginnings of the field of women's history. So just to give a little background, um, what were suffragists doing in late 1919? Well, they were very much celebrating the passage of a presidential and municipal suffrage in Tennessee. Um, the state suffrage organization was moving towards a League of Women Voters organization. And really, um, a Tennessee suffragists did not expect the state to play a significant role in the ratification of the 19th Amendment because of a clause in the state constitution that forbade legislators from voting on a federal constitutional amendment sent to the states after they were elected. But um, this rule was overturned along with similar rules in other states and Tennessee eventually became pivotal to the ratification process. So it was in the midst of all of these things happening that a request came for a Tennessee a suffrage historian to write the history of the movement in the state from 1900 to the present, which for them would have been uh, early 1920. Um, Ida Husted Harper was a professional historian. Um, she worked basically for the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And she was in charge of editing the new volumes to come out of um, the suffrage history for the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And she had a set plan for working with an author in each state about what they were supposed to provide in their report. And basically the state suffrage association was supposed to select a historian um, to write their state story. But there was a difficulty when it came to Tennessee. Um, Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the national organization, tried to write to the president of the Tennessee organization. There were communication issues and it, it turned out that uh, Catt basically nominated um, Tennessee suffragist Catherine Kenney to be the official historian and problems ensued. So um, Ida Husted Harper wrote to Kenny and to others involved in creating the history um, not to talk about splits or factions, but that was going to be pretty uh, impossible to do because that was a defining characteristic of the Tennessee suffrage movement. So let's talk a little bit about the divisions within the state movement. So um, the state suffrage organization split in 1914 over disagreements regarding the location for a national uh, suffrage organization conference. And um, for about four years, there were actually two statewide suffrage organizations in Tennessee. The Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association and the Tennessee Equal Suffrage In Association Incorporated. So one was incorporated, one was not. Um, the two groups were reunited in 1918 to form the Tennessee Woman Suffrage Association under the leadership of President Katherine Warner of Nashville. However, 
important divisions related to region and affiliation with these two groups during the split um, would continue and influence the writing of, of suffrage history. Catherine uh, Taltikini of Nashville um, was a major suffrage leader in the state. Um, she was a joint chairman of the campaign committee, which helped to establish suffrage chapters in local communities all throughout Tennessee. Um, she was also um, very important in the state suffrage movement, and she would eventually serve as the ratification chair for the League of Women Voters. Um, other, lead, other suffrage movement leaders praised Kenny for her intellectual prowess and also for her political knowledge. And um, she was really um, a, a good choice, right, um, to write the suffrage history. And Catherine Kenny started out by asking suffragists throughout the state for help with her work. So um, she sent a circular letter around to different suffrage organizations in local communities throughout the state. And she asked for them to submit information about their work. There was also a article published in the Nashville Tennessean where she asked for contributions. So she really tried to be inclusive, but this effort kind of got her into trouble. So um, you'll see here an image of Margaret Irvin Ford. Um, she helped to lead a movement basically protesting Kenny's selection as the suffrage historian for Tennessee. And Margaret Irvin Ford was active in Chattanooga. Um, she was from Lookout Mountain. And um, she had been a leader in the non-incorporated group during the split. She was actually the last president of that organization prior to the reunification. Um, uh, she was very active in suffrage and had served as an, an officer in suffrage organizations. But she had also uh, proven to be somewhat of a divisive force in the movement. And she and Catherine Kenny had had disputes over published histories in uh, newspaper articles kind of previously. So there was a history there. Um, and she helped to basically foment a protest against Kenny. So let's look at something that she wrote to uh, Ida Husted Harper. Um, one of the things Ford protested was basically how could a suffragist based in Nashville really know what was going on in other parts of the state? So regional divisions continued to be important. She also um, mentioned that she considered Kenny to be a bitter partisan in the a suffrage split in the state organization. And it's clear that Ford incited other suffragists to also write to Harper, protesting against Kenny um, being the historian for Tennessee. So there was quite a dilemma. Abby Crawford Milton, who was the president of the state suffrage organization and also the first president of the leader of the League of Women Voters organization. Um, she was very much in favor of Kenny and objected to Ford um, participating as a historian because she had not been um, approved by the state organization. And um, uh, this was really an issue. So she wrote uh, protesting uh, Ms. Ford and um, pointing out that Kenny had asked for others to submit their contributions and was trying to be inclusive. So what basically happened was Harper told Milton that it was too late. Um, that both Ford and Kenny would be allowed to prepare their own histories of the state suffrage movement in Tennessee from 1900 to the present. And then um, Carrie Chapman Catt would decide what to do 
with these accounts. Um, so basically this is very much highlighting the divisions within the movement and the national history of the suffrage movement that's going to be published. And that's what happens. So within the history of woman suffrage for this volume, there are actually uh, multiple Tennessee history articles, one by Catherine Kinney that focuses on the suffrage movement in the state from 1900 to the present, and one from uh, Ford that also looks at this time period and that also includes ratification. Um, so I also want to mention something very important, and that is we need to look at whose voices are not being included in these histories. So African-American women tended to be marginalized within suffrage organizations and within the histories written about the movement. The history of woman suffrage publication is noted for marginalizing their voices. And it does not seem that African-American suffragists in Tennessee were offered an opportunity to really participate in writing for this national publication. However, that in no way indicates that African-American women were not active in the suffrage movement. And Catherine Kenney, in her account of the state suffrage history, discusses cooperation between African-American suffragists and white suffragists. And um, even though she was certainly limited by the racial views of her time, this was unusual for a white suffrage leader in the South to um, basically support voting rights for African-Americans and to publicly talk about um, working with African-American women suffragists. I'm gonna start my comparison of Kenny and Ford's histories by um, pointing out something they agreed on. So both authors agreed that Lyde Merriweather um, was a pioneering suffrage leader in Tennessee. Um, she was from Memphis, and uh, both authors very much credited her for her work in the early movement. Okay, to get a bit more in depth in comparing Kenny and uh, Irvin Ford's draft histories. So, um, an important thing to note, as far as historical sources available to us today, um, there's some great resources. There's wonderful correspondence between um, the different individuals uh, available at the Tennessee State Library and Archives in the Carrie Chapman Cat Collection. Um, we also have drafts written by Kenny and um, Irvin Ford of their um, suffrage chapters. And then we have the published articles in the history of woman suffrage. So um, there's quite a bit to compare. And these materials also led me to some other questions that I, I'll discuss a bit later in my presentation. So both Kenny and Ford presented their Tennessee stories in the history of woman suffrage. So they each had their own chapters and they're both identified separately as authors. Significantly, there was little overlap between their histories, either in their draft forms or their published forms, which illustrated how suffragists actively engaged in the movement could have very different perspectives on what an official history should contain. Ford tended to place greater emphasis on local suffrage work, especially in the Chattanooga area. Kenny really focused on a statewide story and emphasized connections between the state association's goals and the priorities set by the national organization. Of the two authors, Ford overtly described her own activities to a greater degree. And though Kenny mentioned Catherine Warner, 
Ford includes more information regarding her activities, which Warner was one of the individuals who wrote in protest against Kenny being the historian. So there were definitely um, some issues there. Both women took their roles as historians seriously and discussed with Harper plans to publish or archive their work beyond just having it printed in the history of women's suffrage. Kenny was heavily involved in the Democratic Party and the League of Women Voters and was significantly impacted by family moves and illnesses. So although Kenny displayed considerable dedication to creating and defending her history, she seemed to have less zeal for the production and editing of her writing. And her family situation really impacted her ability to comment on ratification. Um, she had a seriously ill child. Harper wanted Kenny to write about the ratification story, but Kenny essentially had to decline because of her child's illness. And Ford ended up writing the story of ratification. Um, so Ford really displayed a greater volume of work and a more enthusiasm in its composition and editing. So although Kenny really had a larger role in the state suffrage movement, Ford was more persistent and ultimately more successful at the task of producing state suffrage history. Okay, now I'm gonna look at some editorial trends. So, when the drafts were sent to Harper and then published in the Nationals history, how were they different, right? How did they change? So there was a noticeable tendency to downplay a conflicts between suffragists in Tennessee. Both Tennessee authors had things omitted from their drafts related to conflicts between suffragists. There was also a tendency to remove any sensational or potentially controversial information before publication in the national history. An example of this is um, Kenny had talked about a sulfuric acid attack at the 1913 State Association Conference, and that was taken out. It, it was not included in the published version. There was also a tendency to remove references that would link suffragists to any kind of radicalism. Ford referred to socialists, and um, that was edited out. Um, so that, that was not included in the published version. There was also a tendency for a reduction of criticism of opponents particularly public officials. So that was uh, significantly reduced from the draft to the public version. Um, there was a shift in tone to be less emotional and more impersonal. So the Tennessee authors' efforts to be dramatic and really share that part of the story tended to get minimized. Um, there was also significant uh, reduction or removal in the list of names, both of suffrage supporters and opponents. And there were a few editorial changes that seemed designed to reduce redundancy between the two histories. It's like Harper would decide, okay, this author is going to talk about this topic, and this author is going to talk about a different topic. And um, that, that is evident in the histories. And really, uh, studying these drafts and uh, published articles led to some further questions. So I, I want to mention the process of remembering and forgetting, which Tennessee suffragists were very much engaged in. So Carrie Chapman Catt, the national suffrage uh, leader, was very much involved in the ratification battle in Tennessee and was a close correspondent with several Tennessee suffrage leaders. And she actually wrote to multiple Tennessee suffragists about how she hoped that some 
aspects of the ratification movement could be forgotten. Um, this was a very hard fight for suffragists. Um, and there were some discouraging after effects because there was really a backlash against that suffrage victory within the state. And it, it's interesting, you can see both Cap and Tennessee suffrage leaders writing about their parts of the ratification movement, uh, particularly that would better be forgotten. Um, and an example of this, is an incident that occurred in Rutherford County. So um, a suffragist from Rutherford County um, named Sarah Spence DeBeau wrote a booklet that she titled The History of the Case. And DeBeau uh, basically talked about her work in advocating for suffrage within Rutherford County, particularly to um, Senator Todd, who was the Speaker of the Senate at that time. And um, I was very excited that, that ratification was supported in the Senate and it, it passed, but she had an unusual experience. So she went to attend a celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment that was part of a larger national celebration where churches were going to ring bells um, in honor of the 19th Amendment. And um, while she was there at, at a church on the square in Murfreesboro, she discovered there was an indignation meeting going on in the courthouse on the grounds where people were protesting Senator Todd's support for the 19th Amendment. And they were really angry. There was this angry crowd. And uh, poor Senator Todd, um, uh, she felt like he had really been uh, treated badly. And she encouraged suffragists um, as they were voting, right, to remember who had supported the 19th Amendment when they cast their ballots. Um, but she acknowledged that uh, Senator Todd would probably never exactly get over um, that unpleasantness and that bad memory. So uh, part of writing a suffrage history in Tennessee was very much not only choosing what to remember, but what voices were not being heard and what parts of the movement did suffragists really want to forget? Um, it was a, a difficult time and um, in thinking about suffragists writing their own histories, it's important to remember what a contested process this really was. And it's interesting, even before the ratification, the suffragists in Tennessee recognized that writing their own history was very important. And they were concerned about the historical legacy that they were going to leave in the future. And I want to conclude with a quote from Margaret Irvin Ford. So um, this quote actually refers to the work she did in writing suffrage history, which she characterized as the hardest work she had ever done. Um, so suffragists saw this as really important and very much hard work and part of their contribution to the movement itself. Um, thank you.